this is one of those messages that I don't know if I've quite mastered fully. I don't know if I've quite mastered this attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. It's one that I think I've, I've struggled with actually in life. And I think that for me, I can, I can get behind and I think it's a great idea and, and I, I understand what it means to, to love like Christ. That, we started out this series with the reality of, of talking about love. And, and I think we all can admit and can support this, this truth of what it means for us to love like Christ loved. To see and understand the need for us to love one another, to love the least of these, to love our enemies even, to love one another just like he has loved us. And we feel this so deeply and passionately. Love is one of these moments for us in our lives that we feel deeply and passionately when we have it. A love for a child, you feel really deep for that child. Even when they've messed up and even when they're struggling, you love them deeply and you love them through it. A love for a spouse, you feel this deeply, even when they drive you insane. You still love them through it. And I think love is one that we can talk about and it, it resonates with us, but in a way, I think it's a little easier for us to understand in some ways. And even joy, when we talked about joy, we talked about the difference between joy and having a joy-filled life and the difference between that and being happy in life, right? Happiness is this emotion. It can come and go just as quickly as it can. Like, it doesn't stay with us. Where the joy of the Lord, the joy sticks with us. When we know Jesus, when we live in his name, when we live in his presence, we can have this joy that bubbles up from the very bottoms of our feet to the very hairs on our head. Joy is not simply this emotion, but rather it's this lifestyle choice that we can have and live in God's joy. It can't be taken away or overthrown. It's deeply rooted in our unity with him. And nobody can argue that we seek peace in life. Nobody can argue that we desire to have peace in the middle, in the midst of our lives, not only within ourselves, but even in our world. As things have kind of calmed down in our world, we, we've kind of settled into this place of what some would say is this, this peace moment. But I don't know if it's fully peaceful yet. And I say that because there's still brokenness, there's still destruction, there's still a lot of hatred in our world. And I don't know if we're ever going to fully understand the full peace of Jesus and the full peace of God until we're in his presence or until he has made himself here manifested again. We have his spirit and I believe that we have access to his peace, a, a peace that surpasses our own understanding, a peace that we can't even comprehend. And I think we're, we're taking steps and we're striving towards it but I can't wait for the moment. I can't wait for the moment where the peace on earth is felt like it's never been felt before. See, we long for these things, but I think it leads us to this next uh, attribute, aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Today, we're going to talk about patience. Woo -hoo -hoo. I don't know about you, but I remember often times and Growing up and as a teenager, um, I'm not the most per like patient person in the world. If you haven't caught on yet, I'm one of these guys who just kind of, I'll, I'll, I act and then I'm like, I, then I think. Does that make sense? I'm like, yes, we're in it. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And then I'm like, wait a minute, that might not be the best idea in the world. As I'm already halfway in the decision I've already made, right? Like, for example, last night, 9.30 p.m. I signed up to run the Grand Rapids Half Marathon again. Yes! Then my very next action, like 30 minutes later, is I'm filling everything out and Courtney's sitting next to me and she's like, so you're sure about this? And I was like, no. <laughs> but I don't have this moment. I, I think for me, I, I just, I don't have the patience of sitting and thinking about stuff. I, I just, I don't like that. I, I don't like sitting still. I don't like doing all this stuff and being patient in life. Maybe I'm the only one who struggles with patience. Maybe I'm the only one who has heard the, the common phrase, right, of, well, don't pray for patience because God will give you an opportunity to develop it. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. yeah. I learned a long time ago, I stopped praying for patience back when I was like 16. 
I was like, I will not be praying for patience because that means God's going to give me opportunities to learn patience. And if I'm not patient already, if I'm in an opportunity where I have to learn patience, I'm going to get real frustrated real quick. But patience, I think, is, is something that we need to maybe talk more about. And, and I think we need to also be very honest with ourselves when we talk about it. Again, Galatians 5. We're going to read this passage every single week. I don't want to lose it. I don't want to forget it that, that this is what Paul says. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. The Holy Spirit produces this fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. It produces these things. When we are in him and when we are new creation in him and when we are growing in him, it tells us that the fruit of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit produces patience within us. Patience is defined as this. It's defined as the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, to tolerate trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset. I think the reality of patience is one that I think it's rather hard for some of us to possess. When I was sitting there writing this message, um, I don't know how far forward I can go, by the way, but I feel like I'm in a cage back here. I got no room for activities. Um, so we're coming up here. When I was thinking about patience and I was writing this, it brought me back to a movie that I remember watching a few different times. Um, and it's one that maybe some of us have watched, maybe some of us haven't. It's a movie called The Wild Wild West. Anybody have seen this movie? Will Smith, right? So, um, and, and I remember watching this movie and I, I was loving it and everything. But then it dawned on me that um, I'm like Will Smith sort of in that movie. See, here he is. Will Smith is this, um, essentially what he is, is the, one of the first secret service agents, okay? And it's set in the wild, wild west. And he has his, his partner. And his partner is very diplomatic. His partner is one of these guys who, if we have an issue, we're going to sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's sit together and let's get everything out on the table and let's have a conversation to solve the issue. But then there's Will Smith. Will Smith. And the Will Smith is one of these dudes who, we have an issue, we're just going to act upon it, and then we're, we'll figure out the details later, right? He's one of these guys who, who kind of, his, his mentality and his philosophy is, is, he says it in the movie of, well, I'm just going to shoot first and ask questions later. And you're like, how effective is that sometimes, right? The same people that you need to ask questions to might not be able to answer your question, if you know what I'm saying. And so I often wonder, though, how often in my life, and maybe even for some of us, maybe if that's the mentality we've, we've taken on our life, right? Where something, a situation comes, and we're called to be patient in these moments, in these situations, especially when it's in conversation with another person. But instead of being patient, what do we do? We just act upon it. At least for me. I'm one of these guys who, spur of the moment, let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm one of these guys who doesn't sit and think through a lot of stuff. I often wonder if it's that attitude that we have even with God. God has given us a situation, life circumstances that he's, he's calling us to be patient in. He's calling us to walk slowly in. He's calling us to pause. But instead of pausing, instead of walking slowly, we decide we're just going to push through it. We're going to sprint. One of the hardest parts about um, kind of the COVID and everything, um, occasionally I liked to go to the gym. I, and I say occasionally because it was supposed to be a regular thing, but it never turned out to be a regular thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, but when I would go to the gym, uh, you're supposed to do this thing called cardio. I hate cardio, <laughs> but I signed up for a 13.1 mile race last night. So I'm going to run 13.1 mile races and I hate running. But have you ever jumped on a treadmill? Anybody? Come on. Okay. How many of us love, love running a, on a treadmill? I, I, I hate treadmill running because, you know, as you're getting there 
and you get on and you're supposed to put that safety clip on, nobody does it. And you start it, right? And it's like really slow and you're like, okay, this is like a sloth. And then you just start hitting the up arrow of like more, faster, faster. And you start getting to a point where you're like, okay, now we're, and then you keep going and now you're jogging a little bit. Have you ever just seen how fast you can go? Like I've, I'm that guy, right? Who like, I'm just going, I'm going, going, going. I'm like, I'm like 7.5 miles per hour, not fast enough. Nine miles per hour, I'm about to die. This is great. Like and it's exhilarating and you're sprinting and sprinting and you have to grab a hold because you're about to fly off the back of the treadmill. I think sometimes that's our mentality in life of God is saying, I want you to take it at about three. And then we get out on the treadmill and we're like, a three, God. You know, I can, I can comfortably go about 5.5. And he's like, I know. Okay, we'll go at three. But then we just get this moment in us where we're like, I'm out. And we just start hitting the up arrow. It's this pace. And I think patience is similar to that. I think when we have patience, God is calling us to take it at this speed. But instead of our idea of taking it at 5.5, he wants us at three. And I think we have to take it at three sometimes. And that means we have to remove our own ego and our own pride that is ruling us sometimes and letting him Take control of it. Believe it or not, I'm not a gardener, but I've come to realize that fruit takes time. Fruit takes time. And spiritual fruit takes time. So we have to stop trying to hurry up what God is doing in our own lives and let his time be the manager of that. We live in this culture that puts everything in a microwave rather than a crock pot. We want things now. So it's quicker for me to hit the button for 30 seconds or one minute rather than let it sit for an hour, two hours, three hours in a crock pot and cook. Did you know that if you want radish, does anybody know how long it takes to grow a radish? 20 days. 20 days to grow a radish. What about a pear? Anybody know what it takes to grow a full-grown pear? Seven years. Anybody want to grow a pineapple? Two and a half years. Here's my favorite one, an avocado. From seed to a, a plant that you can actually eat avocado, how long does it take? How many of you guys like avocados? 10 to 15 years. Woo! I ain't got time for that. My boys love avocados. We need like the express avocado plants. But that's our point, right? Like fruit takes time. It takes time to, to plant it, to water it, to cultivate it, to weed it, to, to give it the right sunshine and everything. It takes time. I don't plant a seed and then a few hours later, dig it up and start looking at it saying, why haven't you grown into a tree? You don't plant a seed and dig it up every few moments to say, where's my fruit? You plant a seed knowing it's going to take what? Say it louder. It takes time. The fruit of the spirit also takes time. When it's planted in us, it's going to take time to manifest. And that means he's growing it. That means he planted it for a reason. That means he's going to water it in the right time in the seasons. He's going to cultivate it. He's going to weed it and prune. Woo! We're not even going to go and talk about the pruning right now, but woo! Y'all know those seasons where God is just pruning stuff out of your life? Yeah, those are not fun, but they're needed, right? Right. Fruit takes time. So why do we keep questioning what God is doing? Why do we keep questioning the hard work and the decisions that, that have been made to get to the place that we are at? We need to have patience. We need to stop overthinking and keep watering the seeds that God has planted. I love Paul. Paul, I, I think, recently has grown to be one of my closest homies in life. Um, I feel like I know him pretty well, the Paul of the Bible. I, I feel like... He says certain stuff and he does certain stuff. And I'm like, man, Paul, you just get me, dude. You just, you feel me on this. And I love what he writes to the church in Corinth. And um, 
in, in the book of Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 13. He's writing to this church. And you have to remember that as he's writing to the church in Corinth, the church is literally in this hodgepodge of, of worldly things and worldly desires. And so he writes them to not only instruct and correct them, but also I think in a way, God is, is allowing him to write as a season of pruning the fruit of this church. And he writes this, this verse, and, and most of us are probably well familiarized with it. Love is patient. Love is kind. I find it intriguing that the first thing he says that love is, is patient. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when even, whenever the truth wins out. It doesn't give up. Love never fails. It doesn't lose faith. It's hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love, though, is patient. I love that he, he talks that love itself is patient. Love is patient. So when we know and when we live in Christ and by his love, we too are called to live in through a place of patience. In 1 John 4, we, we get this verse that says, God is love. And if you know God, you know love. And so if God equals love, that means that God also, you can insert God instead of love in 1 Corinthians 13, that God is patient and God is kind. So, so God is patient. And if his love is patient and we're called to live in love as Christ has loved, that means we're called to live in love as a patient follower and believer of Christ. In, in all the situations and all the things that God is doing in our life, God's patience with us, I believe, is a, is a work of his own spirit when he shows us his patience. You see, a lot of times when I'm impatient, my impatience morphs into something more. My impatience usually comes in the place of looking a lot like some frustration or maybe some anger. Or even in our world, maybe even violence. And it's the opposite of what God's plan is for us. Like patience with a little child as he's trying to understand what mine means in sharing. We're working on it. <laughs> but patience is living with an attitude of forgiveness throughout the day. I think that's so key. I remember reading that in a book that patience is living with an attitude of forgiveness throughout the day. And I'm like, man, that's actually pretty good. And then they expounded upon that. In order for me to be patient, I have to make up my mind that I'm going to forgive people all day long for not meeting my expectations or doing things according to my perspective. I'm going to let that sink in for about three seconds right there. Patience is living with a mindset of forgiveness throughout the whole entire day. And I have to, from the very moment I'm awake, make up my mind that I'm going to forgive people when they don't meet my expectation or do it in my own perspective. But here's the other kicker. I also have to give myself forgiveness and patience when I make mistakes throughout the day, knowing that I'm going to need it as well. I'm going to have to forgive just even life in general for the existence of having hard times in life, right? Not only people, but like I have to make up my mind to forgive the situations that I'm going to be put in. I have to choose to either interact in that with frustration and anger, or I can choose to interact with that with deep patience and calmness. I look at Jesus all the time and I think about like, he gave so much breathing room to not just feel emotions and have emotions, but to interact with those around him. He gave room for grace and room and space for all these different things that could have happened. He chose from the very moment he was awake every single day to forgive others when they didn't even meet his expectations. I wonder how often when I wake up in the morning, God already knows I'm going to need a lot of patience with Kyle today. 
And he does it and he gives it freely. This patience is a moment to moment mercy followed by cleansing forgiveness. It's a moment to moment mercy that he gives and he pours out followed by this cleansing forgiveness. That we can have and enjoy love, joy, and peace even over a period of time when people and the events annoy you. We can have all of this when we demonstrate and, and live in his patience and his presence. In, uh, I'll flip to the right tab here. Ephesians 4, again, again, I, I'm telling you, me and Paul are like best friends right now. I think I'm reading through the majority of his letters right now, prepping for a lot of this stuff. In Ephesians 4, Paul speaks about this unity in unity in the spirit. He's talking about unity in the body. He's talking about your own body. And he's writing to the church in Ephesus. And I love that when Paul writes, he, he talks about even his own experiences. He reflects back on his own experiences. He's writing this letter, and this is how it starts out in, in chapter four, actually. It says this, verses one through four. Therefore, I, Paul, therefore, a prisoner of serving the Lord, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and be gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Be patient with one another because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one spirit, and just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. This unity that we have in the body is made through the patience with each other through his love, through his spirit. I find it intriguing that when, when I really read a lot about patience, a lot of times it also comes back to love. And I think that's a natural possible byproduct of loving as Christ loved. That when we love each other as Christ loved, that we can have the same patience that he has with us. We can have unity among each other when we love like he has loved us. I find it so intriguing. I find it this, uh, that this idea, even though that we have the power and the rights to take revenge, we, we don't. That's what I think it comes down to with patience even. Rather, I think he calls us to suffer for his glory and in his presence with unity. And that leads me to this next thought of if we're called to be patient, if we're called to walk this fight, that means we have to have endurance. What I learned last year in training for this marathon or half marathon and running it, you can start out running as fast as you want. But somewhere down the line, your endurance is going what takes you to the end. I play a lot of um, softball and, and basketball. And one of the things that I do really well in those sports is I'm, I'm rather quick. So for my softball team, what another player would hit, it would just be a simple single. But I can stretch that into a double because of my quickness. But what I've learned is that I can train for my agility. I can train so much for this, this quickness. But if I also don't have the endurance, my agility and my quickness will fade later on in the game. Right? And I think that's similar to how we need to look at different stuff even, even with our walk with Jesus. Are we training in our patience? Are we walking with him in patience? Are we diving into him when we need more patience? Or are we just so caught up in the here and now that we forget that he's called us to have a patient life as well. Again, it's that microwave versus crockpot mentality, right? We want it and we want it now. But what if God is calling us to sit on it and let it just grow and be infused with what he's doing? What if he's calling us to just let him just absolutely slow cook what he's doing in our lives so that it would be beautiful? It'd be more flavorful than we could ever even imagine. 
What if God is calling us to have that same mentality in our own lives? To be patient, to pause, to let things sit for a little bit before we just go and act. The last truth that God, I think, really was wrestling with me in this as I was prepping for this message was, was his reality that God exercises more patience than I could ever imagine with us. Like all those days that I reflect back of when, you know, maybe, maybe kids are testing my patience, maybe things at work are testing my patience, maybe situations at the store are testing my patience. God has exercised more patience with me and with us than we could ever even imagine. Those moments, I think, where we've seen people, and maybe we all know one of these people where we've been praying for them for so long that they would just, they would just see God, that they would get it. What about God exercising patience as we had that journey? I remember what it was like when I knew about God but didn't really know God. I knew about him, I could talk about him, I understood the stories, but I didn't have that deep heart knowing of who God really was and what he wanted to do in my life. All those years of knowing God but not truly knowing him, God had so much patience with me. You know those years where you just made not so wise of decisions? His patience was there. Those decisions where you chose something else over him, his, his patience was there. Even that moment right before you cross that line of faith, he's sitting there patient knowing that it might take another three months for you to cross that official line, but I'll be patient and I'll keep watering those seeds. I'll keep growing the fruit in you and you too will see it. That God, God has exercised more patience in our lives than we could ever know. He's given us more grace than we could deserve. He's more patient than we could ever even imagine. So why don't we model and show the same patience and grace to those in our own lives? And why don't we give ourselves the same patience and grace that God has given to us? The patience in the spirit allows us to bear adversity, to allows us to bear even injury. It makes us patient, patient to wait for the improvement of those who did us wrong. Years and years and years, maybe somebody has wronged you and you're walking in patience and trying to forgive them. I believe God is working in that. I believe that, that God is, is showing us his, his spirit in a new way. And if we're just going to call it what it is, I think in our world, I've talked to a few of my um, buddies who are also fellow pastors. One of them recently, he, he pastors over in Detroit. And I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but this past Friday was something. Does anybody know what Friday was? Juneteenth. For a lot of us, we probably never really dug into what Juneteenth was. And that's okay. That's cool. But recently in my heart, and I know I've maybe talked a little bit about it, and that's, you know, but for me, I've, I've, I've had just a new awakening to some stuff in our world. And, and my buddy posted this thing about Juneteenth. Juneteenth is celebrated as the, the day where the last slaves essentially heard about the Emancipation Proclamation and were freed. It was about two years after the Emancipation Proclamation actually came in. But it's a day that they celebrate a freedom, true freedom of slavery. And I remember he posted this and I just commented and I said, thank you so much for this. This is, this is amazing. This is This is gold. And his comment back to me was, I'm just thankful that you are entertaining and trying your best with these conversations. Here's what I've become aware to is that here was this guy, a buddy of mine, a pastor. He used to be a, a youth pastor who I worked side by side with. Josh and I interned with him. And it's not like this is the first time this conversation has come up. But at least for myself, I didn't always sit down at the table to have the conversation. Does that make sense? I'd hear it and I'd be like, uh, I'm going to go over to this conversation maybe because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. 
but I'm trying. And that's all I said to him is I'm, I'm just trying. I think of him and the patience he's had with me over these years of speaking about this. And for some of the time, me kind of blowing it off and other times me diving into it. But now having real conversations, hard conversations, deep, hard conversations about race and reconciliation. This past winter, as we were at 41 Hours, Josh, Sarah, and I had the opportunity to sit down with him and his wife as they were there, and we had the conversation, a, a, a pretty intense conversation in some ways. And he talked very openly, and he gave me a new perspective of when I'm raising my two boys, of a reality that things of I'm not aware of, I might have blinders on, that now just the conversation of, are you preparing yourself right now for those conversations with your boys of maybe some friends at school when they go to school might be saying about them? Are you preparing yourself right now for the conversation of when your, your son Kendrick turns 16 and he gets pulled over? Or the day when he picks up a friend as he's driving who is a, uh, let's just, what about the day where your son Kenny at maybe 17 years old has a little uh, certain liking to a girl and she's white? Are you having those conversations? Are you prepared for those? And are you even right now today, Kyle, are you, are you sitting down with him and having those conversations? I just look back all these years and the patience he's shown me and the grace he has shown me in those conversations where I was invited to the table, but I never pulled out the chair. I'm thankful for his patience. I'm thankful for patience, not only with him, but with others who, who have had hard conversations with me, not even just about race, but conversations as I was growing in what it meant to be a youth pastor. The patience they had as I messed up, believe it or not, I messed up. I made some bad decisions. And then a parent emails my boss and was like, hey, what, da, 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 at what point did you think it was a good idea? And then Monday morning shows up and I walk in and he goes, hey, Kyle, we have to have a chat. And I'm like, oh, what happened? He's like, well, the parents really didn't like the idea of you didn't tell anyone you were making tapioca pudding slime and these kids got doused with slime. You probably should have notified the parents because when they went to pick up their child, they're covered in this tapioca pudding and a mom showed up in her brand new whatever and didn't really want her kid crawling into their car with tapioca pudding from head to toe. And for me, I was this, I think Josh was there that summer with me. Like it was, I, I loved it. I thought it was the best summer in the world. I thought it was a great idea. Like we're playing these games. We're going to have the losing team get slimed, but we didn't tell them. Well, the mom didn't appreciate that. And those decisions, the patience after decision and email after email where he fielded it and then he had patience with me to grow me and prune me in some of that stuff. I'm thankful for the patience that I've been shown by people around me. And now I hope that I can show that same patience as I model leadership, as I grow, and as I learn even in this moment of how to lead well. And I hope that I think all of us, I think all of us, what, what can we dig into to show and to understand God's patience more? And I think so often we get this idea and this false idea of the world will say it. And even in the church, we talk about it like God gives his hardest battles to his strongest soldiers. Anybody ever heard that? That God saves his hardest battles for his strongest soldiers. I'm going to call that out and I'm going to say, I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't know if that's totally true. I don't know if I buy into that because I don't think he gives his toughest battles to the strongest warriors and soldiers. But rather, I believe that God empowers the faithful to continue the good fight through his grace, through his strength, through his power. 
The reality that God will not give us more than we can handle, I think, is, law, is a lie. I, I believe that God does give us more than we can handle. Because I think that as he does, we are called to patiently walk with him as we grow in strength in him, as we grow in faith in him. And I'm wondering right now, maybe what situations, what things are we facing right now that we are supposed to be growing in our patience. We're supposed to be growing in our faith. And at the end of the day, it comes down to the question of what and who are we going to rely on? Are we going to rely on ourselves and our world and our own strength? Or are we going to be patient? Are we going to trust his timing? Are we going to trust his seeds that he's planted in our lives? And are we going to rely on him, knowing that he is God and he is good? The things of this world will give out. They'll fall short. They'll fail. And I truly believe that God calls us to have patience and love like he has with us. And I think when we start to live in that, and notice here, not perfect it, by the way. I don't believe God is about perfection with us. I believe he's about progress and participation. When we participate in his love, when we participate in in growing in his patience, I believe that is when God will continue to show up and do incredible things. Even when we're facing things in life that seem dark and heavy and hard. The nice thing, I guess, about being a child of God is that it is well with my soul even when it is not well with my circumstances or situation. I can trust that it is well with my soul even when my situation and circumstances might be really, really pressing and testing. Because no matter what, when we come to him, he shows up. No matter what, when we seek him, he is there. No matter what, when we need him, he provides. No matter what, his timing, his timing is always better than our own. And in all of that, all of that, I can say it is well, even when it may not feel like it, it may not look like it. We can trust his plan and his timing. So be patient with whatever he is doing. Patience, I think, is one of the hardest ones. And I don't know about you, but I've read a lot of just different stories in the Bible about God and what he was doing, what he continues to do. And I oftentimes wonder, I oftentimes wonder about David. A guy after God's own heart, how did he have the patience to trust God even when things seemed to be falling apart? Or about the Israelites standing at the very edge of the sea and they're like, now what? And, and God parts it, but did they have the patience to stand there and trust that he's going to deliver away? even when they could see the, the dust of the army come behind them. Did they have the patience in that? I think of the disciples and their fishing. It's intriguing that the first things the disciples did after Jesus died, it says that when he appears, he finds them and he finds some of them back on the boat. What are they doing? They're fishing. I don't know about you. I'm not a good fisherman. You want to know why? I don't like to sit there and wait for a stupid fish to bite my hook. I don't, I'm not good at it. If I throw that hook out there, I want 30 seconds or less, whoop, and it in my boat. You know what I'm saying? I think about these guys, these disciples, and they're fishing, and Jesus walks up on the beach, and he looks out. And I, I just, this is the Kyle version in my mind playing out, right? And he looks at them and they're throwing their nets over and they're pulling them in and they're not getting any fish. And I picture Jesus standing there like, how long do I let him go? I'll start a fire. And he starts to build this fire and he keeps looking up periodically and he's like, they still haven't seen me, it's okay. And then finally he just looks at him and he goes, Try the other side. And they're like, we've done that. He's like, you don't understand. Just try the other side. And they throw it overboard. 
And it says they can't even pull the nets in. Why? Because there's so many fish. And I love the fact that like instantly they know, right? Like they know who it is. They're like, oh, it's Jesus. And one of them jumps overboard. That one resonates with me. He thinks, or sorry, he acts before he thinks. He's like full clothes, iPhone, you know, in his pocket. He's like, I'm going swimming. He just jumps in. He's like, it's Jesus, we're out. You know, he's like, Ksh. and he shows up and Jesus just says, hey, I made a fire. Let's have some breakfast. The amount of patience that God has had with me and with you is unbelievable. And he stands right there, even in the midst of this struggle. And he says, I have it. But do you trust me enough to make a way? Because you can try to plow through this, but do you trust me enough? Do you have the patience to trust my timing, my will, my heart, my goodness over your own? And I believe when we show that same patience with others of forgiveness, daily forgiveness that he reveals his heart at a deeper perspective for us every single moment, every single day. And that's the challenge today. How do we wake up every single day knowing that it's a moment by moment mercy that we give to others around us to have patience with them and patience with ourselves, even when it doesn't make sense.